Welcome brothers and sisters, we are still continuing with Tazkiyah 3 and we are talking about the symptoms that stem from the desire, the two diseases which are doubt and desire. We already talked about uh, a handful of them in the last few weeks and uh, one of the ones we just finished was one of the symptoms of the tongue, which is backbiting, which is a sign that you are sick with doubt to the degree that you backbite. So we need to fix that. Of course, the brother mentioned, and that was a very good insight, that there's a component of desire as well, which is revenge. So the revenge would be more like a desire because it is a lustful state. It is something that you... you uh, you satiate, and we'll get to the definition of desire in today's lecture. So today, I wanted to focus on uh, one of the symptoms that show up from the eyes. Okay, so symptoms of a sickness, of a disease. There are only two diseases: doubt and desire. We have focused a lot on doubt, arrogance, envy, backbiting. Those are all related to the disease of doubt because you doubt Allah's qadr, you doubt Allah's power, you doubt Allah's hikmah. When I say you, I don't mean you, I mean, you know, we as humans, we tend to doubt. We want to fix that. Now I want to, I want to uh, touch upon one that is classically related to the disease of desire, okay? Things that are related to the diseases of, uh, uh, what's some, disease of desire are obvious. Things like greed, you want something, you just want it. And subhanAllah, you can learn a lot by studying a child. And we've talked about this before. And this is, a, this is an Islamic concept. Allah teaches us about Adam before he became mature. And in many ways, before he was a messenger, when he was first created, he behaved like a child. He saw something and he couldn't resist. Everything is for him except this one thing, but he went for that. This is desire. Because Adam knew he was wrong. He knew it right away, so it wasn't doubt. It was, he couldn't control himself, so he needed to learn those tools to control those desires. And Allah mentioned to us, and this is very important, focus with me, we're building a foundation. Every, this is a very important point, every son and daughter of Adam, no daughters today, have sawet. Sawet. This is very important. This will help you in tazkiyah. Sawet means evil potentiality. Everyone, <coughs> nobody does not have sawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Adam and his wife, Eve, they had sawat, which means many bad potentials. But Allah covers those bad potentials with what? Who's going to tell me? Who knows? How do you cover your bad potential? We did it in Tazkiyah too. Yes, fine. What is, I want the one word. Taqwa. Taqwa. Wa taqwa dhalika khayf. Allah said, wear the clothes of taqwa and it will cover your sawa, your, your badness. It will cover it. So, every son and daughter of Adam is equal potential to do bad. This is a very important point. You know why? This goes right in the eye of arrogance. If I appear to be better than you, meaning I do good deeds and you don't, am I inherently or intrinsically better than you or not? No, because we both have the same sawa. Let's say one person is a murderer and one person is a scholar. They are equal in their sawa, meaning they both have potential to be bad or good. Who is the one who guided this one to good and guided this one astray. Who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who is the one who guides and who is the one who leads astray by his will? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important to know. But he's given you free will. So by your own choice, he will use you. And this is from the comprehensiveness of Allah's power. Meaning, he is the one doing, Allah. But he is choosing based on what you hear, what's in here. If you choose good, he will use you for good. And if you choose bad, he will use you for bad. If you understand this, so many of the concepts of our religion will unlock for you. Therefore, someone who finds that they are good, who should they thank? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All praise is due to Allah, nothing for you. No praise for you. And if you look upon your brother, and you feel, even for a split second, that you are better than them, right? Then you have committed kibr. You have committed arrogance. Very common, very common. And arrogance stems from what disease? Doubt. Doubt that Allah is the one who gave you everything. You, don't, you think you are good because you are good? You are good because Allah chose you. This does not go against free will. Remember we said, somehow the Christians got confused. They thought free will means free action. It doesn't mean that. You choose good, Allah uses you for good. I make intention right now to pray Qiyamul Layl. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know what Qiyamul Layl is, right? The prayer after Aisha. This is one of the best voluntary actions you can do. Pray during the night when everyone is sleeping. I made the intention. Will I get the reward? Will I pray? Will I pray? Up to Allah. If I pray, how much reward will I get if it's for Allah? Ten times. What if I don't pray? How much reward will I get? One. One. See, how the, see how it makes perfect sense now? Allah is saying, you have the intention to pray, but you are not worthy. I don't want you. Go to sleep. I will give you the reward. One. He loves you. He thinks you are worthy. He gives you ten times and he lets you stand in front of him. So when you pray that qiyam, you should be thanking Allah, not yourself. Let's say you pray qiyam for 40 years. And your brother, he never prayed Qiyamul Layl one time. Are you allowed to think that you are better than him? No. You are not, because who is the one who allowed you to pray for 40 years? No. Yeah. You see, this is the sawat of Adam. This is the very important concept. You possess the sawa, I possess the sawa. Sawa means evil potential. The story of Adam and Eve that you read in the books is from the Israeliyat. Which means from the Jewish tradition that when they ate from the tree, they became naked and they saw their private parts. This is all false. Nothing like this exists in, this, in Islam. Did it seep its way into our books? Yes. But this is from the Jewish tradition. The correct understanding of the story is that they ate from the tree. Bedet lahuma sawatuhuma. Their many evil potentialities became clear to them. If Allah meant private parts, He would have said, so atahuma in Arabic. For those of you who know Arabic, He would have said two, because you have two. So atahuma. But He didn't say that. He said, when they ate from the tree, they saw all of their evil potentialities. So they started to cover themselves with the leaves of Jannah. So the Jews said to cover their private parts. Nonsense. Why do you think they were covering themselves with the leaves of Jannah? Huh? Because we get this from the hadith. We know from the sunnah of Rasulullah. Because they were afraid of Allah. They were running away from Allah. So Allah said to Adam, based on the, on the hadith, Why are you running, Adam? Do you think that I cannot find you? He said, Oh Allah, I know you find me. I know you see me. But I am ashamed. I do not know where to run from my sawa, from my sin. You did not teach me what to do. I do not know what to do. Very different than shaitan. Right? Shaitan became arrogant and puffed up. So Allah said, say these words and you don't need to hide that, that, that your sin will be forgiven. So this story, which is in the beginning of the Quran, is very important for Tazkiyah. You and your brother are the same. That's why in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the son of Adam killed his brother. And the story is twisted again. From the Jewish tradition, we understand that, the, that the, the brother envied his other brother and killed him. This is false. This is not in the sunnah of Rasulullah. This is from the Jewish books. The correct story is, the son of Adam, Qabil, 
even though that name is not in our tradition. But let's go with the name, because the name has some meaning. Qabil, tuqubbila minhu. His actions were accepted by Allah. Look, Qabil, Qabila. Qabil, tuqubbila. You know what I'm saying? The ayah, tuqubbila. Qabil, tuqubbila. Killed Habil. Habil from Habala. Like a, a, a careless man. Okay? Qabil thought he was better than Habil because Allah accepted his deeds. So he killed him. Look what he said. Look what, This is the proof for you. I'm planting a seed for you. I don't want to get into a big debate. Okay? Go back to Surah Al-Ma'idah and look up the ayah about the two sons of Adam. Look what he said. فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ After the brother killed the brother, he then became from the khasirin. What does khasirin mean? Losers. That means, was he a loser before that? No. That means he could not have been the one who was doing bad deeds. He was the good one. And then he killed his brother because he thought he was better than his brother. فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Then he became of the losers. You see? And that is why Allah sent the crow. Another misunderstanding from the Jewish tradition. Allah did not send two crows. He didn't say that. If He said two crows, we would say two crows. But somehow from the Jewish books, seeped into our books. Two crows. One crow dig a hole, the other one bury it to teach him how to bury his... Do you think Allah would teach a murderer to bury his kill or to teach him don't murder? Which one do you think is more, more appropriate? If someone murdered someone, Allah would say, killing is wrong, don't murder. He wouldn't say, by the way, O oh murderer, this is how you bury your, your kill. The real story, as Allah SWT mentioned in the Quran, ghurab, one, one bird, one crow. He sent the crow to show him that you are like the crow. You are like the crow. So he looked at the crow and he said, I wish I was not like this crow. I am like the crow. You know what the crow does? From the hadith of Rasulullah, what does the crow do? What is the characteristic of the crow? Huh? From death? Uh, no, more general. I don't know if that's true or not. More dead. More, more uh, general. What did the crow do? <laughs> Allah said it in the ayah, right? فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ غُرَاب غُرَاب is a crow. يَبْحَثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ What does يَبْحَثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ mean? Digging. digging. No, not digging. <coughs> digging, then you make a mistake in the understanding of the ayah. What does يَبْحَثُ mean? Looking for? Looking. Searching. Now I did this because that's his beak, right? So he is searching. What is the crow searching for? Always looking for something. Always searching. What is the example of the crow for the human here? Do not be like the crow. What is the crow always doing? Searching for the faults of his brother until he kills his brother. The mu'min does not think he is better than his brother. That makes, hadith makes sense now. When a man who was praying and fasting and doing great things for 40, 50 years, Authentic hadith. And his brother was doing everything wrong. Every day he came to him and said, Come, let's go pray in the masjid. Come, let's do some good things. Stop doing what you are doing. Is this good to give advice to your brothers? This is mandatory. Today, we don't give advice. And what do we do? We don't give advice. What do we do? We backbite. So, I, won't, I see you doing something wrong. Instead of being a man, which is my duty, in a polite way, of course, and I go to you and say, don't do this. Now, you might be annoyed with me, but that's the command of Allah. Amr bil ma'roof. I come to you and say, I see you smoking behind the bleachers in school. Don't smoke. Who are you? Don't tell me what to do. This is my duty. Do not smoke again. Tomorrow he smokes again. What is your duty? What is your duty? Do not smoke. What, do you kill him? Huh? Do you fight him? Do not smoke. Third day. Do not smoke. Fourth day. How many times do you, when do you stop advising your brother and sister? When do you stop? Never. Never. And this is your duty as a mu'min. It is not your duty to kill him, nor it is your duty, listen, to think that you are better than him. Subhanallah. So the hadith, famous hadith that you all know. The man, after 40, 50 years of advising, someone help the young man get a nice chair. There's a good chair there. Look, look, right there. After 40, 50 years advising, one day, he got a little bit self-righteous. By the way, the person who says something 
Because when you read the hadith, you might think, wow, Allah is really tough on this man. 40, 50 years he is worshipping Allah. And one day, look, he says, he says to him, I have been advising you for 40 years and you are still bad. Go. You will never be forgiven. Just like this. Another way of saying it, go to, go to, you know, as I say, go to, uh, you know, you know what, okay? Or forget you. Okay, who needs you? Okay, you're a loser, right? Translate it into modern language. From that one sentence, Allah said, who is the one who has grabbed my, my robe? The robe, the robe of Allah is a metaphor here. Who has grabbed my robe of, of uh, kibr? Allah is the only one who deserves this, this honor of saying you are good or you are not good. Only Allah. Who has grabbed my robe? So, this is the Hadith, hadith Qudsi, as they say. You don't need to call it Hadith Qudsi, but they, they sometimes say that, right? Who has grabbed my robe and said that I will not forgive so and so? Let it be known, this one is forgiven and in Jannah, the one who is bad. And this one is in Jahannam, the one who was worshipping Allah for 40 years. Now, anyone without the understanding of this tazkiyah and the diseases of the heart will not understand why the punishment is so severe. He said one word, go, Allah will never forgive you. Yet he is in Jahannam. And the, and the one who is not doing good, he is in Jannah. Because Allah knows what's in the heart. Shaitan was doing good deeds, Iblis, his whole life. And he did one thing wrong. He said to Allah, I know better than you. And he is in the worst of the, pe worst of the creation. So, because it exposes the evilness in here. That person who said to his brother, Go, Allah will never forgive you. What is he assuming? What disease is that, first of all? Doubt. Yeah, no, kibr is the symptom, right? The disease is doubt. What is it that he doubts? If I think I'm better than you, go. You will never be forgiven. That I am saying many things. I am saying I am in Jannah. You are not allowed to say that. I am saying I am better than you. I am saying I deserve what I have, and you deserve what you have. Right? Meaning I deserve the goodness and you deserve to be bad. Right? All of these things are kufr. They are, they are not high level kufr like, you know, the kufr of I worship this idol. But they are words of kufr. It doesn't mean you are kafir when you say it. It means they are statements that hide the truth. What is the truth? Allah controls all things, deserves all praise. You are not better than your brother except by what? By taqwa. And who is the one who judges the taqwa? Allah. Can you say, I have more taqwa than you? How do you know? Allah SWT says, وَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ We are learning tazkiyah, right? So we are learning tazkiyah. Let's say you start doing these things and you purify your heart. Can you say, Alhamdulillah, I have tazkiyah? Can you say that? Allah says, do tazkiyah. And then He said, do not say that you have tazkiyah. Allah said, do tazkiyah. And then He says, وَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not say about yourself, that you are good. Because you don't know. Only taqwa differentiates you and taqwa is in the heart. And Allah knows. Yes, taqwa, there's action involved. But Allah is the one who knows. This is a very important foundation to build. Because I am teaching you things that you will, you will unfortunately, a shaitan will attempt you to judge your brother with them. And say, oh, he does this. And he does this. He is not good. I am good. You are not. Only Allah knows who is good and who is not good. Until the day of you die, you will not know if you are in Jannah or if you are in Jahannam. You may hope in Allah and hoping is good. Hope in Allah. So, one of the, one of the symptoms of a disease of desire is fornication. Or lusting after the opposite gender. Now, sometimes this makes people uncomfortable when we talk about this. And I have done this many times, so I know. And I do not know why, well, I do know why it makes them uncomfortable. For the men, it makes them uncomfortable because they're often engaged in it. And with their eyes. I'm just being frank and honest. I have enough experience with this to say. And for the women, it makes them uncomfortable because somehow they think this topic is an attack on them. So I want you to let your guard down, and it's not the case. First of all, this is from Allah and His Messenger, which means it is important for you to hear. And it is not something fleeting in the Sunnah, but it is something stressed in the Quran and Sunnah. 
When something is stressed in the Quran and Sunnah, what does it mean? When I say stressed, multiple times it is mentioned. Why? Why? Do you think Allah needs to say something more than once to be serious? Right? So if something is mentioned one time in the Quran, it is equal to being mentioned ten times. Allah said it. If one hadith is mentioned once, equal to being mentioned one hundred times. But there is a stress factor. What is the lesson that we learn if something is mentioned many times versus mentioned a few times? What is the lesson that we learn from this? What is the wisdom? It's more important. More important. Not necessarily. I just told you Allah's command once is enough. That we forget. Okay, good. You're on the right track. That we'll forget. But there's more to it. You need to hear it multiple times. Yes, because why? It's very really dangerous. dangerous. Okay, Omega yes, but why? Why is it very dangerous? <laughs> because it's easy to do. So when something is mentioned many times, you will do it many times. You are always in trouble. You are in danger of this thing. It is very hard for you to resist. But when something is mentioned only one time, like in the Quran, do not kill your kids. How many parents want to kill their kids? Very few. By the way, this is a big, big sin. But Allah mentions only once, very, maybe once or twice. Once He mentioned the, the scene in, in, on Day of Judgment, and one time He says, Do not kill your kids, khashyata imlaq. Do not kill your kids from poverty, worry about poverty. How many parents really want to kill their kids? Very few. It's not something that's human nature. So Allah says, Don't do it. Yes, there came a time during certain periods in the world where people killed their kids for whatever reason. Poverty was the reason Allah mentioned in the Quran. But Allah mentions, do not look, avoid zina, do not fornicate, do not lust. How many times? Many times in the Quran. Big ayahs. Big. How many times in the Sunnah? <sighs> maybe 50. Okay? More than 50 maybe. Maybe more than 100. I have gathered some for you. So do not be ashamed of this. And I don't know why people don't talk about it. It's, you need to talk about it. We need to hear it. It's better to learn what Rasulullah said and what Allah said about this. And just so you know, this will help gauge your tazkiyah. Because we talked about the disease of doubt. But I want to show you that we have a disease of dunya in our heart. Disease of desire. We worship our own desires. So much. And I told you, which is more deadly? By the way, the disease of doubt is more serious. Meaning, even if you make one mistake, it's a big, big mistake to doubt Allah. However, which one is more... Uh, 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 one is more serious, but one is more dangerous, meaning it is always with you. Which is the one that's more likely to destroy you? Desire, because it is you. It is you. Whereas doubt, Allah may forgive it out of ignorance. You are ignorant, you did this, you said this, big, big deal. But you were ignorant, you did not know, so fine. But desire, it is something that you know, and you are aware, and it is from you, and it is between you, inside you, and you are chasing that. So, um, maybe I didn't explain it very well, but you know what I mean. The more imminent danger is your desire. That's what I mean. The doubt can be fixed very easily. I teach you the right thing. Or someone teaches you. Rasulullah tells you, don't say this, say this. Don't believe this, believe this. Done. Easy. The desire is the one that even if you are a scholar, even if you are someone with great knowledge, desire is there, pulling you every second. So, Zina is one of those things. Now, zina does not mean the full act. Now, I see that there's some young people here. Don't worry, it's okay. Rasulullah would teach this thing to nine-year-old boys, ten-year-old boys. Why our boys have to learn it from the high school or the school? Why can't they learn it from the sunnah? That's much healthier for them. So do not worry about this, okay? Uh, and by the way, they know more than you, okay? Your kids. So do not be naive. Uh, Zina in Arabic does not mean when you, use, when, you, when you say zina mutlaq, meaning open it means the full act of intimacy between man and woman uh, but when you use it muqayyad, it can mean other meanings meaning tied, there is the zina of the eyes zina of the ears zina of the hands, zina of the nose <laughs> right? and that means seeing, smelling touching, tasting, whatever uh, uh, looking Different things, hearing, the sounds that lead to that. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is show you the seriousness of this. Allah 
وَلَا يَزْنُونَ So Allah put zina with shirk and murder. And He said, be careful. Major sin. He said, and those who do not invoke with Allah another deity or kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed except by right and do not commit unlawful intimacy. Yeah, now, of course, this ayah means the full, the full zina. We understand, but I'm just building the foundation for you. And whoever should do that will meet a harsh penalty. Now, even the steps, the steps that lead to that, that lead to the full act of intimacy, are also haram and cut off from the root. I told you Allah is stressing this in the Quran. He didn't just say, don't make zina. He said, don't even approach zina. Don't even come close to it. Look what he says. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not approach unlawful intimacy. Indeed, do not approach it even. He only said, do not approach about two things in the Quran. What do you think they are? Do not approach. Two things. What are they? Alcohol, alcohol. alcohol and zina. Once you get into alcohol, hard to get out. And once you get into this, uh, the zina, hard to get out. Don't approach. Stay far, far away. Okay? And so uh, some foolish people, they came and said, no, no, the verse for alcohol says, Vegetanibu. Vegetanibu, which means avoid. It's not as harsh as this one, right? No. Vegetanibu is harsher. Vegetanibu means stay far away from it. So if alcohol is here, you go away from it. So then they ask you, well, can I have dinner with people who are drinking alcohol? Listen, between you and Allah, you do whatever you want, but you know the answer already. People are having alcohol, don't be next to it. Don't be near it. Allah says, Fej tanibu. Turn away. Turn your back. Do not see it. Do not engage in it. Well, can I sell alcohol in my store? Allah says, Fej tanibu. Be far away from it. Well, I'm not drinking it. I'm just selling it. Subhanallah. You do what you want. Okay? But this is taqwa. Taqwa is you fear Allah. You, you get run away from what is haram. So even the steps towards zina are dangerous and Allah cut it off from the root. And... The first step, what is the first step towards, in general, what is always the first step towards this illegal intimacy? What is it, do you think? What is the first step? Huh? Talking or the thinking? Yes, well, the thinking, you say, I will be left from that. Correct, fine. What is the first thing that you have control over? Let's put it that way. Huh? You, you touch before you look? I don't think so. Right? Looking. Right? Looking is the first step. So Allah spent a Half a page in the Qur'an talking about it in Surah An-Nur. More than half. Two large ayahs. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَضُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Tell the believing men to reduce their vision. And this is the proper translation. Some people say, uh, uh, lower your gaze. This is not accurate translation. Because lower your gaze... Uh, it seems a little, it's not correct anyway, okay? The true, the true answer is, you can see the woman, or the woman can see the man, but you are not looking at them, okay? So this is called, right, uh, restricting your vision or reducing your vision. The difference between seeing and looking. The difference between looking and lusting, okay? Meaning keep looking. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, Ya ghuddu. Ghuddu means take a part of your vision away. Now, if you lower your gaze like this too much and you don't see anything, you will bump into stuff. So that's not the point. The point is, you see, you know what it is or who it is, right? And the companions used to say that. Omar used to identify the women by their name. I know who you are. You are Hind. I know who you are. You are Sauda. Wife of Rasulullah. Rasulullah used to identify the women. Say, I know who you are. Hind. You are Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan. It's there. We're not living in a sheltered society. Everyone is in a closet. Okay? We know who everyone is. But we do not gaze upon them. We restrict our vision. Allah says, tell the believing men to reduce some of their vision. And look, connect it. And guard their private parts. Look what Allah says. That is purer for them. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ What is أَزْكَى? Pure, pure. Tazkiya. Pure for them. That means, if you engage in looking and lusting, this is for men and women, then your heart will become sick. 
Now, the sickness of the heart, Allah mentioned it for men, not for women. Very interesting, right? He says, Meaning, who is more hurt by the looking at the opposite gender? Who is more affected, men or women? Men. This is obvious and everyone knows this. Maybe the women don't because they're naive a little bit about how men think. But men, for them, this is a tremendous desire, huge desire. Just the looking itself is a desire and fulfills something. So you must guard yourself from this. And Allah is saying, guard yourself. And then Allah scares you a little. He says, indeed, Allah is acquainted with what you do. I know what you are doing. I know what you see. Right? Allah says in the Quran, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ He knows the trickery of the eyes. وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ And what the chests are hiding. What does the trickery of the eyes mean? I could be looking here, and everyone thinks I am looking here, but I am really looking here. Right? And... Uh, um, or lowering like this and I'm looking like this or looking at something Allah says I know what you are looking at so be careful the eyes are a gift from Allah protect them remember we did shukr what is the meaning of shukr what is the meaning of shukr guys wake up come on what is the meaning of shukr to give what you have yes to, to use what Allah has given you in the way that would please Allah right the translation of shukr, best translation I could, I could come up with, gratitude. Allah gave you eyes. Do you like your eyes? Is vision a good thing? Right? Yes. Use them in a way that would please Allah and you will never lose them. And you will all, He will strengthen them for you and keep them for you. Okay? A at least He will reward you for your usage of them. May Allah protect our vision and may Allah protect all of us. Um, it doesn't mean that He will take it away from you if you uh, disobey him in that, but he can't. He may. So be careful. Uh, now, when Allah mentions a command in the Quran, it is for men and women. <laughs> but sometimes he mentions for men and then for women. Why would he do that? Why would Allah say the ayah for men? It would have been for women too. But then he gave an ayah for women also. Same ayah. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And tell the believing women also to reduce some of their vision and guard their privates. And not... Uh, why would he repeat that twice? What do you think? Okay, again, stressing. Stressing the importance. Because women are different than men. When men look upon women, they lust. When women look upon women, it is not the same. Alhamdulillah. They do not have the same feeling. They are not gaining some benefit from looking upon the man. The sickness in their heart is not increasing by looking upon the man. That is why, okay, women have, um, women are more, are more, are better in positions where they are caring for sick people who may be compromised or on the battlefield, like from the Hadith of Rasulullah. They used to care for the, the wounded. I mean, the wounded. Maybe he is cut down in his belly. So then she must care for him. They are not affected by those visual things like men. Also, there is a beautiful hadith in Bukhari, which uh, is very interesting and profound, subhanAllah. In the beginning of Islam, the people who entered Islam, were they rich or poor? poor. Very poor. So poor, some of them did not have more than one garment to wear. In addition, their garment typically did not cover their whole body or their whole privates. When they made sujood, their privates would show. Who was behind? The men. The women. Behind the men is the women. So Rasulullah would tell the women, listen, this is in Bukhari. He said to them, because of the inconvenience of the clothing, obviously this would change later on, right? He said, do not raise your heads, O women, until the men have fully risen from sujood. Why did he say that? Because they will see, they will see everything, right? So, now, that means there is no doubt that they saw. But does this affect them the same that it affects men? Absolutely not. Can a man pray if there is a woman in front of him? Rasulullah forbade this. Do not pray with women in front of you, okay? Because the man is a man. That's the way Allah built him. It's different. So, again, do not be uncomfortable by this, but learn this and teach this to your children. But look, look what's very interesting in this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
in the first ayah, but men, he says, uh, restrict your gaze, protect your privates. This is pure for your heart. For women, he did not say that. Look what he said. This goes along with what I'm saying. He says, restrict your gaze, protect your privates, and do not expose your adornment. He did not say, this is uh, purifying for your heart. Because the women looking upon the man does not affect her heart the way it affects the man in terms of sickness, addiction. Okay? It doesn't cause that. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned here, so men are looking for the physical. What do you think the women are looking for from men? So men are looking for the physical beauty from, from women. This is the baseline. What are the women looking for from the men? You get it from, that, from this A. I don't need a psychology book. This is from the A. Allah, the creator of the universe. Attention. Attention. How do I know that? Allah said, look, and do not reveal your adornment. Look, at the end of the ayah, look what he said. Um, do not strike and let them not stamp their feet to make known what they conceal of their adornment. Subhanallah. So the woman can be wearing niqab. She can be wearing the full niqab. You cannot see her. But the Arabs, what they used to do before Islam, they used to strike their heels because they're wearing what? Anklets. What we call like bracelets, not bracelets, you know what I mean, the anklets, the jewelry on the ankles that make a clinking noise. So they used to strike their heels so that, what, what do you think when a man hears this clinking noise on the foot of a woman? Will that get his attention? Yes. So Allah says to the women, I know what you are doing. You are getting their attention. What is it that the women seek from men? Attention. Is the beauty is secondary. Does, do women recognize beauty in men? Of course. But does the beauty affect them like the beauty of women affects men? No. What affects them is the attention of men. So Allah says to them, do not seek the attention of men who are strange to you. And Allah says to the men, and do not look upon women because it will make you sick. It will make you sick. SubhanAllah, this is the creator of the universe. He knows. Wallahi. And each one of you knows what I'm saying is correct. And it has to be. Because this is what Allah said. He made you and he made me. And you can learn about men from the Quran. And you can learn about women from the Quran. SubhanAllah. Um, and there's more to it than this, but this is the basic idea. By the way, this ayah is the ayah of hijab. In case someone thinks there's no ayah of hijab in the Quran. This is a big phenomenon in the world now. There's no hijab in the Quran. Islam has no hijab. Right? Uh, this is made up by the men. It's right there. Allah says, and cover your breasts, right? With your khimar, with what is over your head. Okay? So this is, this is hajjah. That's what it is. Um, and then Allah says at the end of this, and turn to repentance, O mu'minin. Turn to repentance. Why did he say return to repentance after these verses? Why does Allah say that? You will fall into it. Because you will fall into it. Every person will fall into this. So turn to repentance frequently. Frequently. You see something, you turn. Okay? You seek repentance. You, you, you saw attention from a man? Now, so a man, a man should not look at a woman, and a woman should not look at a man. A man lusting at a woman it makes himself sick. And a woman, lust, a, a woman looking at a man, seeking his attention, if she gets his attention, she will become sick with the attention. And she may, her mind may go, go astray. And for the man, his, his, his heart will become sick. Prophet ﷺ said, Al-aynani tazniyan wa zinahum al The eyes make zina. Rasulullah said, the eyes make zina and their zina is looking. And the, uh, and the ears make zina and their zina is hearing. And the hands make zina and their zina is touching. And the privates uh, confirm this behavior or belie it. Meaning, that's the last step. You don't get there until you start there. So don't start. Prophet ﷺ said, a very scary hadith. Sometimes we need to be scared a little bit. Rasulullah knows that. Uh, I don't like to, like I said, make da'wah by scaring, but sometimes you need to hear a few things. Okay? Prophet ﷺ said, أَن يُطْعَنَ فِي رَأْسِ أَحَدِكُمْ بِمِخْيَاطٍ مِّنْ حَدِيثٍ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَنْ يَمَسَّ مْرَأَ لَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ Subhanallah. If a metal rod were to strike you in the head, it's better for you than to touch a woman that is not halal for you. Okay? Now, remember I started the lecture by saying to the women, 
do not be offended by this kind of talk. Because the problem is not in the women. The problem is a sew'a in men, a potential. So when I say women are fitna, which is coming, women are a test for men. Women are the ones who are the first test for Ben Israel. Uh, nothing is more harmful for men on their tazkiyah than women. This hadith of Rasulullah, it's coming, I'm going to say this. It doesn't mean that women are bad or harmful. It doesn't mean that. It means that in men, there is a potential. So be careful, men. Guard yourself. Women are independent. Women have nothing to do with you. Women have not, have, have, you cannot blame them. It is you. And you have all the power you need by Allah to protect yourself if you listen to Allah. I want to make that clear. That you would be struck in the head with a metal object is better for you than to touch a woman who is not halal for you. If you are struck in the head with a metal object, what do you think will happen to you? What do you think will happen to you? Huh? Simple injury or significant injury? Significant injury. That's what Allah is saying. That significant injury that stops you from touching a woman is better than touching her. Be careful. Be careful. Hadith Rasulullah said, and if you have done that already, don't tell anybody. This is part of Tazkiyah also. Do not share your sin with anyone. Because if you have a sin between you and Allah, then it is between you and Allah, He will forgive you. For sure. If you ask Him. But if the sin is exposed, and you have taught others the bad things that you have done, and they follow your example, now, on the Day of Judgment, they will take your good deeds. And Allah can forgive you, but they will not forgive you. So be careful. Do not expose your sins. Aisha radiallahu anha has said, this is for the, those who ask, can I shake a woman's hand? Prophet Sallam said, La wallahi, ma masat yadu rasulillahi yadu mra'atin qat, illa mra'atan yamlikuha. Prophet Sallam, the uh, wallahi, Aisha said, the Prophet's hand did not ever touch the hand of any woman except those who were halal for him. Do you think she would know? What do you think? Do you think Aisha would know or not? You know how jealous she was, right? Of Rasulullah. Do you think she would watch him like a hawk? Okay? If he touched any woman's hand, she would know. She would be the one to know. And she said, Wallahi, he never did. Now, we get to a fatwa now. Okay? Which is important because we live in America. This is the hadith. So this is, he is your example. Rasulullah is your example. You know the baseline. Do not touch any woman. Do not shake her hand. However, Let's say, and I've had this question before. Let's say you are in a job interview. And the one interviewing is a woman. And she jumps over the desk. She, not you, okay? To extend her hand, to shake you, her hand, out of the culture of American culture, okay? Now, you as a Muslim, should you shake her hand or not? Okay. If you do not shake her hand for the sake of Allah, you will be rewarded. But you will, you may, uh, uh, huh? Offend her. You may offend her. So, can you shake her hand so as not to offend her, but not upset Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, you may do so in a way that if you are allowed to guard, if you feel that you can guard yourself, if you feel that you are not attracted to her, and you will not be moved by this touch, then you may do so as an exception. Does it mean that it is allowed? Okay, remember, remember I, I, we laid a foundation before in previous tazkiyah. To say something is an exception, does that mean that it is allowed? It is not allowed. It is still wrong. But there may be an exception. And what is the evidence for this? Meaning you may shake your hand politely, and quickly, and not hold on, and double handshake, okay? And yes, I'm very so pleased to meet you, and all of this. You know what I mean. And men know more than women what I mean. Okay? So, the, the evidence for this, and you have to have evidence for everything, is one day a king sent to Rasulullah a silk garment. Two messengers brought a silk garment to Rasulullah. He's the leader of the state. And the king is the leader of his state. And it is a slap in the face if you refuse the gift of another king. It is like saying, we are at war. We are enemies. So the messengers are watching with big eyes. Right, what's the ultimate sign of war in medieval times? I send you a messenger, and what do you do? 
Kill you kill him. <laughs> By the way, those who think that Islam is an aggressive religion, they are wrong. They misread history. Rasulullah did not threaten the Roman kings and the Persian kings. He sent them messengers. And he said to them, Please allow us to enter your country and teach the people the true religion. What did they do? They killed the messengers of Rasulullah. So Rasulullah declared war on them. Okay? It is not like they teach you in the book. Rasulullah said, Okay, now that we have conquered Arabia, which he did not conquer aggressively, it was defensive. Then now let us go and expand our imperialistic uh, 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 action. No. Everyone has the right to listen to the message of Allah. If you let me tell you, Allah is one. Muhammad is his messenger. Here is the Quran. That's all that I have the right to do. That's it. But if you stop me from teaching the people, or if you persecute those people who live in your country from being Muslim, then, now you, have, now you have crossed the line. So, jihad is, and I swear to you, they have made jihad into 180 degree opposite of what it is. Jihad is freedom of religion. Jihad is, you have the right to worship whatever, but freely. Freely. Meaning, I have the right to teach you Islam. You can worship a stone if you want. But I have the right to tell you what the truth is. That is the purpose of jihad. I swear by Allah, this is the truth. Right? And if you stop me from teaching people what is the truth, that's it. Just telling them. And if you stop people from accepting it, or you persecute them, then I must free them to, to worship. So much so that the sky... I know we're going off topic. This is not Tazkiyah, but it's important for the times that we live in. So much so that if there is a non-Muslim country being persecuted, and there is a strong Muslim power in the world, and a non-Muslim country being persecuted by a tyrant ruler, and they call out to the Muslims, and they say, help us! We are not even allowed to practice our religion freely. Any religion. The Muslim duty is to go and liberate them, and not install Islam. But say to the people, you must hear Islam, but you may practice whatever religion you wish. Of course, I am simplifying it a lot. There's more details to it than that. But this is the concept. I don't know how we, how did we get there? Oh, the fatwa, the exception. So he sent him a silk garment. What did Rasulullah do with the silk garment? Is silk halal or haram for men? Is there any discussion or debate about this? Very simple, okay? Rasulullah, what did he do with the garment? Did he wear it? He wore it. He wore it so they would see that he accepted the gift. For a little while. Very short time. As soon as they went away, he took it off quickly and gave it to Umar radiallahu anhu. I said, Umar, this is, not the peop this is not the clothes of the people of Jannah. Take it and sell it. Get rid of it. So Umar asked him, listen, can I make money from it? Can I make a profit from it? Or should I just discard it? He said, no. For some people it is not haram. Right? Women. So sell it in the market. No problem. But we cannot wear it. This is not the clothes of the people of Jannah. But he wore it. So from this, you may take that, if you must, if you must, meaning there will be a declaration of war, right? Or there will be a major problem, then you may politely do so. Still, the scholars said, if you feel that your heart will be moved, then you should not, even if it causes you harm in this dunya. And whatever you give up in this dunya for the sake of Allah, what will you get, worse or better? You will get better, and this is from Iman, okay? But Islam is a beautiful religion. It is not out to heart, hurt people or, or, or to uh, uh, you know, uh, embarrass them or anything like this. But be careful, shaitan might trick you. And he might say to you, oh, you don't want to embarrass that woman, right? that pretty lady right there. Don't embarrass her. Right? Shake her hand. Next thing you know, you're the one who is putting your hand first. Right? Do not do this. Right? If they put their hand, and you must shake it. Right? By the way, what if... You accept the job. You get the job. Now she is your boss. What if third or fourth time she is shaking your hand? What should you do? Now you start telling politely. You say, listen, first couple of times I shook your hand. I, I really did not want to upset you or hurt your feelings because Muslims do not hurt the feelings of people. We don't want like to embarrass people. I respect your culture and your beliefs. But as a man, out of respect to you, I cannot shake your hand. Out of respect to you, not out of disrespect to you. 
Because they, by the way, in American culture, if you don't shake someone's hand, it is like you are disrespecting them. So you must explain to them that in Islamic culture, that the man does not shake the woman's hand, he is elevating her. He is not, dis he is not treating her like a piece of meat. Right? Also, when a man walks in front of a woman Islamically, this is out of respect to her, to protect her. But in American culture, if a man walks in front of a woman, this is disrespecting to her, right? So this is just cultural differences. They have to understand. In Islam, they always, in, in America, they say, women first, right? Ladies first. And you live in the desert, okay? It is not ladies first, right? It is men first. So if the snake bites or the something jumps out, I am the one who protects the woman, right? So just uh, be gentle in how you make da'wah. Because I have seen harsh people also, right? You know, uh, they just... Uh, uh, anyway, they, you know what I mean. The next topic, fitnatun nisa. The test of women. The test of women. For those of you who came in late, I already gave the introduction. And I said, because Allah described women as a test, does not mean that they are bad. This is what the Christians said. The Christians said that women are evil. That women are like the devil. And Jews said the same thing. Not as much as the Christians though. The only religion that says women are equal to men in the eyes of Allah, not in roles. Not in roles in this work, in the dunya. They have different roles, different function. But they are equal in the eyes of Allah. No one is more sinful than the other. They are both equal. So who is wrong from eating from the tree? Adam or, or Hawa? Huh? Both. In Christianity, who was wrong? Who was the one who was wrong? Eve. No, Eve. They blame everything on her. She and the devil conspired against Adam, subhanAllah. That's not correct, right? Yes. Some folks even say the word evil derives from the word Eve. Very, I never knew that one, but that's possible. It's, it's, uh, it, it wouldn't be far-fetched. Because subhanAllah, if you read the Christian literature on the status of women, they go crazy. I mean, they, they, they literally say that she's like the devil. Which makes no sense, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings. Al-mar'atu uh, 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 um, is the half of the man. That's what Rasulullah said. The woman is half the man. I mean, not half, I'm not saying it correctly. Shaqa'iqul rijal. Which means they are the equal halves. Equal halves that make a whole. They are not the same, but they are equal in the eyes of Allah. If you think that this is not a test for you, O men... And we might have to finish this in two parts next week. Another long ayah in Surah Ali Amran. Allah SWT says, Zuyyana lil nasi hubbu shahawati min al-nisa wal banin wal qanatir. And you know the ayah. Shaitan has made alluring. Shaitan has made alluring for people the love of that which they desire. What is the first thing Allah mentioned? Women. Second, sons. Third, gold, silver. Fourth, horses. Fifth, and the metaphor, whatever the horses represent. Cattle, land. First thing he mentioned, shahwa, desire, women. So what does shahwa mean? It means, al-raghba biquwa. Al-shu'ur bihajatika ila shay'i duna ghayri. In translation, the word shahwa. This word is in the Quran, shahwa. Because what does shahwa translate as? Desire. What is one of the diseases of the heart? Desire. So we have to learn what that means. Shahwa. Strong desire for something specific. Listen. That no other thing can fulfill. Very specific. This is a desire. This is a shahwa. Okay? Meaning, you may desire food. I'm hungry right now. Okay? But this is not shahwa. Shahwa means you have to have this thing. Only this and nothing else. But food, maybe I'll take an apple, maybe a banana, maybe some lasagna, whatever. Anything is good, right? This is not shahwa. Shahwa is this very, very strong desire. You can also translate it mean, for something specific, and only this thing can fulfill it. So Allah described these things as having shahwa attached. Women, children, meaning having more. Sums of gold and silver, horses, cattle, and land. These have a desire. You need them and want them only. By the way, not every man will want every one of these things. You may have a shahwa for one thing. And you may have a shahwa for a different thing. Some men just like money. And some men just like power. And some men just like women. So some men like more than one thing. It's a desire that you must 
it is the only thing that will, you think, you think will satisfy you. By the way, fulfilling your desires. Is there such a thing as the son of Adam or daughter of Adam fulfilling their desire? Is there such a thing as that? No. Because Rasulullah said nothing will fill the, the mouth of Bani Adam except what? Dirt. Dirt. So if you have one mountain of gold and you are a luster of gold, will that be enough for you? You will want two, Rasulullah said. What if you have two? That's more than enough. You will want three, and so on and so forth. What if you have one beautiful woman? Will that be enough? It will never end. Same for women and whatever it is that they lust for. So another that, uh, translation for shahwa is lust. A passionate, listen, or overmastering desire or craving. Overmastering. It, it will overwhelm you if you do not control it. We will learn how to control it, by the way. As part of Tizkiyah, we will learn how to control it, but we are learning the source of it first. Yes? No, oh. Prophet ﷺ said, Inna dunya hulwatun khadira. The dunya, indeed, this world looks pretty and green. Okay? And Allah has put you in charge of it to see what you will do. So look what Allah says. Look what Rasulullah says. So be on guard from this dunya. Be on guard. Do not let the dunya take you. Are women part of the dunya? Look what Rasulullah says. Be on guard from this dunya and be on guard from women. Why does he say that? If women are part of the dunya already. Be on guard from this dunya and be on guard from women. Why did he say that? Guys, wake up. Come on. Stressing. Meaning, the dunya will get you and specifically the women. Be careful. Like I said, don't feel left out, sisters. Okay? The men do not get the women, just like the, the same way that the women get the men. Men are also a test for women, but in a very different way. Not in the shahwa, not in this way. You may see very frequently, a woman can go her whole life. Not, not necessarily happily. She doesn't need to be married. She can go on, fine, whatever, I sacrifice, whatever, this and this. A man, that is not possible to even imagine. He needs that, shahwa. So... I'm not saying that woman doesn't desire that, but like I said, the desire is not physical, okay? Or uh, beautiful. Of course, th don't believe the TV, the media. They want to paint women the same as men. So they paint women how men imagine them, which is, oh, he's so beautiful, he's so handsome, he's so nice, and they start describing body parts. Women don't do, that's not how women are, okay? That's men. In TV, they make that like that. And it doesn't mean that a woman cannot be over, uh, some young kid, right? over sexualized in the society that we live in, but this is, this is not their nature. A woman is seeking the attention, the kind word, uh, the appreciation. We talked about that in a different lecture upstairs. Uh, women wants the good word, the kindness, the gentleness, security. She wants those things. The man, he could care less about those things from her. He wants them too from himself. But from her, he wants, what does he want? The beauty. Rasulullah said that. In fact, Rasulullah said, marry a woman. The default is you will marry for beauty. Rasulullah said, fine, fine. You should marry someone that is attractive to you. But that should be, not be your number one priority. What should be? Religion. Religion. Why is Rasulullah stressing that? Because he knows why men marry. It's not a joke. It's not, it's not like, a, why do we have to hide behind and pretend, okay? Men marry for this. So Rasulullah is balancing your priorities. Yes, you should marry someone attractive, because if you don't marry someone that you are attracted to, you will make bulm against her, unless you are strong enough not to. Meaning if you wake up every morning and you see someone that you don't like, right, you will hurt her feelings. So you should marry someone that is that you are attracted to, but there are levels. You do not need specific everything that you're looking for. In Jannah, you will have that. Seek someone that is reasonable in her attractiveness towards you, and every man seeks different things. But more important than this is religion. And for women, more important than that is religion and character. And he didn't even mention beauty for the woman. So, meaning that's not something she's searching for. Obviously, it's something she likes, but it's not something that is a shahwa. Shahwa. Which means a passionate or overmastering desire. Please, someone can shut that door. So, the meaning of this hadith is, and don't misunderstand it do not allow the beauty of this dunya or the beauty of women 
to distract you from your work for akhirah. Does that mean you cannot enjoy the beauty of this dunya? Does it mean that? Does it mean you cannot enjoy the beauty of women in the halal way? Does not mean that. It says, do not let it distract you from the akhirah. Another hadith. Ma taraktu ba'di fitnatan. This is the one that the women get upset about. Nothing to be upset about. Do you think Rasulullah is out to upset women? Nobody in this whole history of the world cared about women more than Rasulullah. I swear. You will not find these kind of statements that he worried about women more than him. Prophet said, I have not left after me a test that is more difficult and more harmful for men than women. Prophet said, That the first of the trials of Bani Israel and the trial that destroyed them was the trial of women. And today we see what they do. I don't want to go into more details, right? Here the difficulty and harm is not the women. The difficulty and the harm is not the women. But the sickness that is created in the hearts of men by lusting after them. So guard your hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Allah now, Ya Nisa and Nabi. O oh, wives of the Prophet, you are not like other women, meaning in position, in status. You are not like other women. You are role models. You are examples. If you have taqwa, if you have taqwa, this is important for all the sisters. Do not flirt. So this is in the Quran, Surah Al Ahzab. Do not, but the translation, let me see if I can get a better translation. Do not be complacent in your speech, which means flirting. Do not be soft in your speech towards men. Now Allah is stressing it for the Prophet's wives. Why? Are women allowed to talk to men? What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. Are men allowed to talk to women? Yes. How else will society function? They are half of the world. Okay? Anyone who tells you can't talk, you know, and then they bring you the hadith of Abu Bakr, they are ignorant. Okay? One day Abu Bakr was, was invited to someone's house and, and he was talking to the man and then the woman, his wife started speaking. He said, I do not talk to women. Abu Bakr said that. Okay? So they take this. Oh, there you go. We don't talk to women. This is not the hadith of Rasulullah, first of all. Plus there is context there. A lot of context. He did not like this woman anyway, to begin with. He didn't want to talk to her. Right? Plus the culture of the Meccans was different. And in Medina, we saw that the culture of the women and men were different. So those are cultural things. We look at our example as Rasulullah first. Did he speak with women? Yes. Did they speak with him? Yes. yes. Did, they edu did he educate the women? Yes. Did they question him? Yes. Okay. Did the wives of Rasulullah educate the men? Yes. yes. Aisha was one of the greatest scholars of Islam. And she educated all of the companions. And she is educating us today. Because one-fourth of the sunnah comes from who? Aisha radiallahu anha. Right? So, she would give instruction and lessons like this lesson that you are hearing now. She, Aisha would give this class. But behind a screen. Meaning there would be a screen and then she would sit and the men are behind the screen and she would talk openly and freely and teach them what Rasulullah taught her and what she saw. So this idea that women are, cannot, cannot uh, function in society, this is all nonsense. Okay? You guard your heart and you guard your actions. And you... you, you you, normal, you interact with women, normal. They are human beings. Okay? You see a Muslim sister walking in the street, as long as you know that your heart is okay, you say, Assalamu alaikum, sister. Right? right? Why, why should you not say, Assalamu alaikum, to her? Right? When, when everyone else who is not Muslim is saying, saying hi. Right? You say, Assalamu alaikum, to her. Say, I'm your Muslim brother. I'm here for you. Right? Give them the dignity. Respect them. Okay? Uh, you don't have to if you feel attracted to them. Meaning, if you're in college... See, I don't want to take anything out of context here. If you are in college and you haven't been married yet and you're still looking for someone, you can't go to every sister walking and saying, Assalamu alaikum, sister, how are you? How are you doing? <laughs> Just doing my duty, right? Assalamu alaikum. I'm here for you if you need anything. This is not. You have to guard yourself, okay? This is taqwa. Taqwa. Do not take these things out of context. You know what I mean very clearly and guard your heart. Shaitan will try to trick you with knowledge. You will have knowledge, he will trick you with that knowledge. He will say, Oh, why would you leave your sister and ignore her like that? Well, I will ignore her because I'm attracted to her. So by saying salam to her and looking at her, I will be, become sick from that. So I will not. 
And sisters do not become offended if you see a religious brother who's trying to be shy, right? Maybe he is shy. Maybe he is, he is being, protecting himself. So let's not judge each other in a negative way. Prophet uh, Allah said to them, O wives of the Prophet, if you fear Allah, if you have taqwa, do not be complacent in your speech, which means you will speak. You will speak openly. Aisha, even though she was wrong, she led an army of men against the killers of Uthman. So how do you lead an army of men without talking and, and leading and giving rules and do this and don't do this? Subhanallah, women are liberated in our religion. Women are strong in our religion. Um, I'll give you a funny story which is relevant to this. One day, Umar radiallahu anhu, he wanted to marry the daughter of, of uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu. This is during the Khilafah of Umar. So he's the, who is the most powerful man in the Ummah? Umar. So Uthman said, you should see her before you marry her. Because if she is not pleasing to you, then you will harm her. So see her first. So you are allowed to look before you marry, okay? Specific. By the way, some young men took this and they said, oh yeah, I'm just looking because I might marry. I'm looking. So he's looking at everyone. That's not the point. The point is, if you have decided she has good deen, her father is good, her mother is good, good I want to marry this person, but I don't know exactly what she looks like. So you should look at her, not other ones, right? And you should look in a way that does not embarrass her, meaning maybe in a way that she does not see. I don't mean like you jump in the window behind your house. That's not what I mean. In a public area. That's what Allah recommended to one of the young, young Muslims. Try to see her if you can when she is in public. Meaning open. Try to observe her to see if her mannerisms are appealing to you. Because if they're not, then you will harm her if you marry her. Because then you'll be like, I don't like you. We don't get along. That's it. You're going to hurt her feelings. So don't do that. See, our, our religion is so beautiful. It, it, it cares about everyone. We are the ones who abused it. So then uh, uh, Omar went to, so he, Omar said, Omar's a shy person too. By the way, he, he, you think that Omar is rough and tough, but he is very modest. So he said to Uthman, how am I going to see her? Uh, I, I'm shy. Like, I don't want her to see me see her. So he said, we have to give you an excuse to see her. So this is her father. Her father is doing this. Shows you the sunnah. Okay? He said, take this plate of dates and go to my house. She is there now. And knock on the door and say, this is delivery from Uthman. So she will be forced to receive it. So when she opens the door, get a good look at her. Right? So she opened the door and he looked at her and he looked and looked. Big eyes. <laughs> Are you allowed in this situation? Yes. This is not the looking of lust. This is the looking of, I want to make sure before I marry. Okay? So, and by the way, this is a lost sunnah. Of course, today we have destroyed the sunnah. We are just looking, looking constantly. But the sunnah of looking before you marry is a lost sunnah. In fact, the scholars say, you may see her the way her father sees her. And then, oh, I'm so shocked. I cannot, I cannot believe that. I can see her without hijab before I, give, before I marry her. Yes, because you are about to marry her. Of course, you see how we have twisted the religion completely, right? We, have, we are looking at haram images constantly, but when it counts... We don't. Oh, we can't do it. Right? SubhanAllah. The religion is very, very reasonable. You don't have to. And she may refuse, by the way. She may say, no, I don't want you to see me without my hijab. But if it's a serious request and they accept and her father accepts and she accepts, she may remove her hijab for you to see her before you marry her. Um, so Omar looked at her. So she said, look, look at the power of the Muslim woman. So she said to him, you think that I care that you are Amir al-Mu'mineen? Wallahi, if you were not Amir al-Mu'mineen, I would pluck your eyes out with this spoon on the plate for looking at me, right? And I will complain to my father about you. And he's Amir al-Mu'mineen, right? She was so angry that he was looking at her. This is, this is the power of the Muslim woman. Don't tell me about suppressing of women, right? Islam is liberator of women, all right? So she went and complained to Uthman about Umar. She's not scared of him, right? <laughs> so Uthman started laughing and laughing, right? That's her father. So she's getting more angry now. Why are you laughing? I'm telling you that he's looking at me. Go do something. This is the honor of your daughter, right? He said, he is looking at you because he wants to marry you. So I, when she heard this, she said, oh, okay. All right, I didn't know. All right, I accept, right? So she said, I'll marry him. So the point is there that there is a time to look 
and a time to not look. And our religion is reasonable. It's not about locking people in the closet like they want to paint it. It's not this and this, black and white. It is not you are liberal and walking around with no clothes. And here, you are walking with a tent. That doesn't, that's not, that's not, it is not, it is not like this, black and white. Right? It is, Islam is for all times and places and is reasonable for men and women to interact in an appropriate manner. Let us just wrap up this section. Uh, the word fitna, because Allah describes this test as a fitna. Fitna. What does fitna mean? Who's going to share with me? This very important meaning. What does the word fitna mean in the Quran? Fitna. You heard this word fitna. I think even in Urdu it might exist, the word fitna. I don't know. But what does fitna mean? Tried. Huh? Tried. Okay, but what does the word mean in Arabic? Originally. Fitna. Originally. Hmm? Fitna is something you... Like Burn it. Very good. Faten to shay, faten to dhahab, for example, is you burn it. I, I burn the gold. Why do you burn gold? Why would someone burn gold? To remove impurities. To remove impurities. So what is the, what, when Allah says fitna in the Quran, what does this mean? A test, a trial to do what? To remove. Yes. To remove your evils. Yes. And to strengthen you. To remove your impurities. To let, elevate you. Tazkiyah. To purify you. Right? That's why you have tests. To expose for you what is in you. And to get you gold, the gold out. Rasulullah said some people are made of gold. And they will not know until Allah tests them. And he said some people are made of silver. This is a metaphor, obviously. Not really made of gold or silver. Right? And they will not know until they are tested. And he said some people are, are made of worthless metal. Like copper. And they will not know until they are tested. Tested. Fitna. Burned. Okay? So... Uh, um, and the evidence for this in the Quran Wallahi, you can get every meaning of every ayah in the Quran From where? From the Quran Or the Sunnah Allah SWT says يَوْمَ هُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ يُفْتَنُونَ Right? The day they are upon the fire Jahannam يُفْتَنُونَ They are on Jahannam يُفْتَنُونَ What does that mean? Being burned Right? Being burned what is, the pur- what is the purpose of being burned in Jahannam? What is the purpose? Before that. To remove your sins. Can Muslims go to Jahannam? Yes. Will they eventually go to Jannah? Yes. So what is the purpose of them going to Jahannam? Purify. To purify them. So you either purify yourself in the dunya, or Allah will purify you in Jahannam. Which one do you like? Do it now. Do it now. Right? That is why, Wallahi, the tests that Allah gives you in this dunya, wallahi, they are better for you than you know. Because if you struggle with them now and you are patient, you are being purified. And if you do not get tested in this life and you have an easy life like the kuffar, like Allah says in the Quran, then you will be burned in Jahannam. So take the test of this dunya gracefully and in stride. So, inshallah, uh, uh, we will stop here and we will continue this topic and complete it next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Disrupt your will. You will not. He will judge you on your will. Do you have the power to move this paper? No. This is the Islamic concept. Okay. Uh, this is not the Christian concept or the Jewish concept. That's why they fell into a big trap because they made a mistake. They didn't make a distinction. Whether or not you move this paper is in the control of Allah 100. percent He will allow you to do it or not. He can stop you or he can make you do it. Okay. So you, that's number one. 
By the way, if you read the whole Quran from beginning to end with this idea, you will see that Allah is stressing this point very clearly. Musa, 